All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us on the show today. We have a guest. Uh, her name is Shweta Argawal. She wants to speak to us today about an issue that we do see come up um, in the community. Uh, we know that Indian people have definitely been on the African continent uh, for a long time. Um, that's for sure. Uh, we know a lot of them was brought in as indentured servants, you know, alongside of, you know, African people who were enslaved, even on the African continent. Then also the interactions, and even some black Americans um, have had with some, not all, some Indian people who have anti-black uh, racism. And we want to talk to Shweta about this because she, you know, can dive into this and even the colorism that happens in India. I know it's crazy because some of them are darker than me or just the same color as me, but yet can have anti-black racism. So Shweta, thank you for joining us on the show today. Oh, thank you so much, Phil. Um, I'm honored to be able to have this chat with you and thank you for helping me spread my message um, in terms of fighting colorism. Um, so I started my journey about two years ago and I'm not gonna lie to you, it was essentially out of guilt because I felt tremendous guilt around the Black Lives Matter movement triggered by um, George Floyd's murder. Um, it really got me thinking very hard about the, the kind of anti-blackness um, uh, racism that we harbor as South Asians inside ourselves, um, especially because I started talking on a Facebook group and it just kind of, you know, spurred from there. And I realized, even though I would like to say that I've never been racist in my own, you know, um, in my own kind of uh, interactions, with um, any community because I've been through so much myself in terms of being bullied throughout my childhood for my color and my, you know, my race. Um, I realized that because of color, there is actually this kind of unconscious bias that, that a lot of South Asians hold against the black community because the narrative with colorism is fair is beautiful. And they're so obsessed with this narrative. It's so deeply entrenched in our, community that on some level you end up perpetuating that to others and of course when I say others I mean people who are darker than us and it's awful absolutely awful and for me I started writing my book about two years ago for precisely that reason because I, I think I was bottling it all up inside and it finally just kind of came out and um, you know as a tribute to George Floyd I would like to say um, I have called myself out in my book and I have confessed um, because of my upbringing, because of my childhood and the bullying that I went through from the age of six for my color, that I started to believe fair is beautiful. And I started to use skin whitening products. And somewhere along the way, you go too far and you don't even realize that you're starting to then harbor these unconscious um, biases towards another community. Um, and so now the book is out and I'm so pleased because it's been receiving, um, you know, amazing reviews and people are really appreciating my honesty. I've had people attack me on TikTok as well. You know, people from the black community say, well, I hope I see you calling yourself out and I hope I see, you know, you talking about your own unconscious bias. And I have, I actually really have. And I would like to say that after kind of two years of going on this journey now, um, the color is in healing. I I do actually genuinely believe and feel that I am now bias free and um, I want to share the message with everybody. I want to talk about colorism healing with people and how we can all do it together and how the two communities can, you know, come together and be stronger together. And, and I think if we have that solidarity, then we can really fight white supremacy and white skin privilege. Well, Shweta, who you said a lot, and I have a lot of a lot of questions. Um, I was just jotting some things down, but but before I get to really what I, you know the meat of what I want to say, let, let let's go back. You know, historically, mm -hmm. um, India. Um, do you still have family there in India now? I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So you know, just let's go back on the history. So India was colonized by the British, correct? Mm -hmm. How many years were they colonized? I would say roughly two hundred years, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so in India was a British colony for about 200 years. Mm -hmm. And what is the feelings toward British people um, in India? Like the overall feelings about, you know, just British or, or white people, or just let's say just British people, white people. What is their overall feelings about them? So um, it kind of, 
how do I say this? They're double standards. That's what I see. Mm. I'm very, very brutally honest. Could you explain on the double standard? Yeah. So on one hand, there's you know a lot of bitterness and anger towards being colonized and having to put up with that and all the um, riches and all the jewels and everything and all the money that was you know spices everything that was stolen from India um, and of course what the legacy has left behind uh, i.e. India being depleted of its resources and obviously being you know a, a, a developing nation um, and it's taking a long time for them to to kind of work their way up and of course fair enough right why why wouldn't there be any anger because um, let's be very honest, the British Empire did essentially deplete India um, down to pretty much nothing when they left. Um, then, of course, there was the partition between Pakistan and India and all the religious um, fighting and everything. Having said that, I do understand that the British actually helped to bring those communities together and they tried to have um, help with India you know, and Pakistan um, uh, staying together. But, you know, um, when they left, they've obviously left behind a big mess as well. Um, but on the other hand, when it comes to colorism and white skin privilege, that is something that when I say there are double standards, that is what I have a problem with. And that is where Indians need to call themselves out and actually realize they can't be pointing fingers at the British Empire for doing, you know, whatever they did 200 years ago and they left 75 years ago. And we're still holding on to colorism. We're still holding on to internalized racism and still putting white skin um, as such on a pedestal and wanting to enjoy white skin privilege by becoming lighter, fairer. And um, colorism, of course, you know, is, um, sorry, the other way around, uh, the factors that affect colorism that that we see now in India are not just because of colonization, but you know, fair enough, there was casteism and classism um, from millennia after millennia, but colonization definitely exacerbated it. I mean, if you're talking about the signs that you would see back then at outside restaurants and, and bars and public places where they say darkies and dogs not allowed, when mm. they say darkies, exactly. And when they, you know, uh, when they were hiring people, if they were of um, Indian origin, they would hire lighter skinned Indians for better jobs for them, whilst mm. the dark skinned Indians, similar to what I understand that people have experienced um, uh, during, you know, slavery amongst the black community, right? The, yeah, the yeah, the white supremacists are the same everywhere he goes. I mean, it's the same system, same thing. You're not telling me something I'm surprised at hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so, so the reason why I want to establish about the colonization uh, mm -hmm. of India. So for 200 years, so the, the white, cause I'm calling white supremacists. That's what they were. And mm -hmm. that's what they still are to this day. So the white supremacists colonized India for 200 years. Now, how many years did Africans, um, colonize India? Gosh, uh, I have to say, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> well, oh, sorry, well, I can answer nothing. that for you. Nothing. Sorry, nothing. Yeah, I thought you were talking. Okay, about okay. I can. Oh, okay. Yeah, if you, if you didn't say zero, I was going to answer it for you. <laughs> Africans have never colonized any group of people. Um, have not stole nobody's resources. And have not um, just did this mass, you know, say uh, genocide. Anything else to anybody else? So nothing. the question I have, Shweta, is this: the one group of people that stole from your ancestors. That have took over your land that has harmed that said that no darkies or dogs allowed, right? Put signs out. Did Indian people wrong for, for a long time and, and still doing the wrong to this day? Because I know they are. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you have anti blackness to it with a people, not you? I'm just saying we're talking about the, the conversation. Why are we talking about anti blackness, colorism, all this white supremacist stuff that, that we talk about right now mm -hmm. when black people? Did or Africans did nothing, nothing whatsoever to Indian people. Could you explain that to me? Because to me, logically, it doesn't make sense. I mean, I would say I would have an issue with the people that colonized me and anybody that looked like them ver versus someone that never did it to me. But explain it to me. Yeah, absolutely. And this is exactly where it doesn't make sense. And unfortunately, I personally believe that it all boils down to color which is extremely, extremely sad and very narrow-minded, shallow uh, thinking. 
Um, unfortunately, India has had casteism and classism um, from even before um, the British Empire and even before, I think, the Mongols, um, uh, co you know, uh, conquered India, right? So India has been conquered millennia after millennia um, from the Persians coming down from like the north, um, uh, northwest of India through the Khyber Pass. And then there was, you know, all these various different Mughal empires. Um, we've got Indians that are extremely light skinned because they were conquered by the Aryan race and the Dravidian race that was like um, more melanated, I'd like to say, um, pushed down towards the south. And the Aryan race became like the, the dominating race. And so we're talking about the kind of light skin, light eyes. Um, and somehow over all these, um, you know, different um, conquerors and different periods, it's kind of been drummed into Indians that light skin is what is beautiful. It's what the perceptions of colorism essentially, right, are that fair is beautiful, fair is better educated, fair is rich, uh, fair is intelligent. So just imagine where does that leave dark people and, and imagine how people think about dark people as in black people as well. And as you just mentioned, there are Indians who are darker um, and who are more melanated than I am or, or even yourself. And yet I, I honestly am baffled by anti-blackness amongst the South Asians and that attitude that Indians have because it, 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 there's no reason for it. It doesn't come from anywhere and it's not justified at all. Oh, sure. It comes from somewhere. It comes from white supremacy. And uh, colorism to me is a symptom of white supremacy. Yes. But really what it is from what you're telling me is that internalized white supremacy is in the society. Yes. And, and that is like, to me, worse than any kind of colonization or slavery. When you are replicating white supremacy on your own and they're not even over there uh, over you like that. You understand? Mm -hmm. See, like over here in America, we're dealing with the white supremacists on the daily. But in India, right? India has a, a Indian president, Indian people running the country, right? Mm -hmm. And yet you still have an internalized white supremacy, which is colorism is just one of the symptoms of white yeah. supremacy. Um, so you mentioned uh, the darker people, right? And, and and correct me if I'm wrong, all the darker people, they in South India, correct? They what? Sorry, say that again. The darker people, uh, even I've seen some that's by black that's in mm -hmm. India. Are they more so in the South? Uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, it's a generalization, but somewhat true, I suppose, because mm -hmm. South Indians tend to be more darker, more melanated than North Indians on average, I would say. Okay. So, so you, you kind of, well, you definitely was put into that category and you mentioned that you were bullied during childhood. Could you explain some of the bullying that you received in, in childhood? So I am from North India. Uh, I, um, I was born in Rajasthan um, and then my parents moved to Japan when I was six years old. And as a six-year-old, you can imagine that feeling of abandonment because I was enrolled in a boarding school. You know, as a six-year-old, you don't understand why, right? My, obviously, it was to do with education. My parents couldn't afford my education in Japan at that time when they were uh, moving. So it took a while for them to um, be able to afford private education. So it was about over just about two and a half years, I would say, that I was in a boarding school. And when you're already going through you know, very low self-esteem and insecurities and anxiety and that sense of abandonment to then be told by your um, extended family that you've been left behind because they're ashamed of your color. I mean, that is trauma. That is childhood trauma on a whole different level, right? To to be told that. And that, that, that stuck. And from that day on, I started seeing people for their color. The first thing that I would notice as a six-year-old is somebody's color. Oh, she's fair and she's pretty and she's beautiful and oh, she's dark. So she's not that pretty and beautiful. And that is this, that sort of bullying, it just stays with you. And that wasn't, that wasn't like the end of it. When I moved to Japan, I had the same thing. Um, throughout my life, I've always been compared to my parents and I've been told things like, you don't look like you belong because my parents are both very, very, very light. And we're talking, my, my father was, uh, pretty much as light as Indians could could get. 
Um, and my brother is also very fair. So I was called like the black sheep of the family as such for my color. Um, the bad apple, the ugly duckling, you know, the black sheep. I mean, you name it, all these sort of phrases were applied to me in school. Um, and then at one point, a brown boy called me Blackie, even though he's a brown boy himself and we weren't very you know, far apart with our, with our skin tone. And I think for, for women particularly, I, I, I do feel, I have to say that the pressure is tenfold because of this narrative and because, I mean, that's a whole different conversation that we can have. Um, the, the kind of sexism and the dichotomy that you see in the narrative that, you know, men are, it's okay for men to be dark and, and not for women and women have to go through the, the, the kind of um, fairness, uh, you know, process. Um, and these dark men are demanding fair wives. You see them in matrimonial ads in India. Even today you see them where that's one of the top kind of five things I would say listed, wanted, fair wife. So things haven't changed. I just visited India recently in December and there is still so much work to be done to, to eradicate colorism and to eradicate this, this mindset and this, as you just mentioned, white supremacy, which is internalized um, in Indians. Yeah, it, I mean, you would think that they would, you know, they would banish the thought, right? You like, you know, with disgust, because as you just mentioned, they were colonized by white people, but the opposite seems to be happening. And skin whitening products are thriving. I mean, the, the industry is thriving. The sales are skyrocketing. Um, it, almost 50% of any cosmetic product in India, um, skin cosmetic products in India, have some sort of whitening agent. Get very wow, that, that's, you know, one thing I can say about, about us here, you know, for the most part, that, you know, we had movements that say, I'm black and I'm proud. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that's that because we needed that living in a system of, of anti black racism and white supremacy. Mm -hmm. We were told the same thing dark is ugly, lighter is better. You know, they had a thing like the brown paper bag test here in America. If you're darker than a brown paper bag, you wouldn't get a job. You understand what yes. I'm saying? Yeah. Um, when dark skinned women in America have dealt with the same issues as well, uh, being you know treated less than and lighter skin has been you know, women have get have gotten sometime. You know, a lighter skin privilege. It has happened here in America. I mean, but that's when you live in a system of anti-black racism and white supremacy, we understand that and we have been tackling that and, and, and still fighting that, you know, head on. But I will say, even though, you know, some sisters that may deal with some, you know, colorism, one thing I don't see the sisters doing is using um, bleaching agents, at least here in America. Now, I know some of that goes on on the African continent when that's very unfortunate, but sure. it, it seems like, in India, and correct me if I'm wrong, you don't have a well, I'm Indian and I'm proud and 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 we we are nationalistic about you know India and, and we love our culture, we love our people. It sounds yeah. like you because you can't have that and internalize white supremacy at the same time. Because bleaching cream wouldn't work if you love yourself. It sounds yeah. like a lot of self-hate. So actually, there is something that I want to talk about in um with regards to that that there is a lot of nationalism in India uh, when it comes to everything else, when it comes to being Hindu and, and the religion there, when it comes to their politics, when it comes to, um, you know, all sorts of other body issues and all sorts of other, um, you know, feminism, patriarchy, all of that. Whoa, they, whoa, whoa, so whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. Did you just say feminism? Mm -hmm. Oh boy, okay, continue. Yeah. <laughs> There is a lot of noise around all these topics and somehow there just seems to be a blind spot when it comes to colorism. So even the Indian you know, film industry, um, and I'm, I'll talk about Bollywood because that's what I have seen you know, from North India. That's what I was exposed to and, and, and I am still today. You don't see dark skin representation, even though there are ample North Indians, including myself, for example, who are more melanated but the darkest as such that you will see is Priyanka Chopra and Deepika. So these actresses are nowhere near uh, in terms of their you know, skin tone um, as, as dark as you will see some quite a lot of North Indians, but that representation in Bollywood is just not there. And every time I call it out, 
I get people bombarding me with messages saying, of course there's representation. Oh, have you checked out, you know, Bipasha Basu and Rani Mukherjee? But guess what? They're exactly the same skin tone. So they just don't understand that there is a need for representation for more melanated women, like for example, Simone Ashley from Bridgerton um, or Charitra Chandran from Bridgerton. So they just don't see that. It's like they don't see that color. They don't see beyond that color. And it's even in Bollywood movies, like there's there are movies being made about, um, you know, bisexuality, uh, transgender, um, uh, you know. Uh, oh, wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, you, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. <laughs> wait a minute. Y'all y'all got all that going How How y'all got all that going on? But you talking about being fervent in Hinduism. How is that going on? Um, there's a lot of that going on. Um, and there's a lot of tension between um, uh, the kind of the Hindu community and the, and the, and the Muslim community there as well. Um, and then of course, you know, I mean, India is, is a wonderfully diverse place, right? There's a lot of languages and there's a, there's a lot of religions. And actually overall, if you see, you know, within the kind of thousands and thousands of years of history, the country hasn't, um, hasn't been divided. Um, but the states are pretty um, secular and you, you see a lot of tension between the communities. There was, of course, the Khalistan movement, which was the Sikhs wanting to separate from India. Uh, Kashmir, of course, has been fighting for its own independence. Um, and then now, you know, there's a lot of movement going on between, and, uh, sorry, a lot of friction going on between the Hindu community and the Muslim community. So they you know, they, they boycott literally things, um, actresses and actors for saying something or even wearing something um, that is revealing because it's against the um, the Hindu culture or the Hindu tradition. If, say, for example, um, an actor who's uh, of, you know, a uh, Muslim background will say something, he's boycotted, he's immediately, he or she immediately. So all of this is going on. But when it comes to colorism, there's literally a blind spot. It seems like nobody even cares. When I was in India recently, I saw in one day about seven ads behind um, one of those, you know, like um, Indian rickshaws behind a rickshaw, uh, which is like a three wheeler um, with a white baby with blue eyes, blonde hair, mm. advertising fertility clinics. Wow. And I'm like, <laughs> that doesn't even, even make sense baby. to me. That doesn't even make sense because. If I was to go to India, you know, eventually I, you know, Lord, Lord, will lead me there because I know that I got to go there because I know there's black people there that I got to go see. I know there's black people there. Black people is all over the world, right? I got to meet my, my people. Yeah. But with, with that being said, I would be shocked if I'm in India and I see a whole ad with with a with a, a Caucasian baby. I'll be shocked. Yeah, I I saw it like 2022, just a month ago, mm. and I thought every time I visit India. I kind of have this hope that things will change. And then I see all these things and nothing has changed from a lady who's advertising a pressure cooker to a lady who's advertising a car. You know, there's all still fair skinned. Uh, people that you see um, that are in client facing roles like receptionists and hotel staff, for example, or uh, air hostesses, they're all, you know, light skinned ladies. Um, you don't see many dark skinned women in the front, in the forefront, in terms of like you know, client uh, roles that have client interaction. Well, so let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question because you said you even use skin skin ble bleaching products, correct? Mm -hmm. I did in, yes. the, in the past. Yes. I did. What 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 was in your mind at the time to say, I need to go buy a product that's going to literally chemicals on my skin that can even give me cancer or mm -hmm. other things, right? With mm -hmm. your skin, mm -hmm. where where were you in your mind to say this is my saving grace? Let me go buy this. So to be very honest, at that time we're talking about the nineteen nineties, right? Um, mm -hmm. I didn't even know. I had no idea. There was no such thing as Google to be able to like see what you know to to Google the ingredients of any product that you're applying. Um, the beauticians at every beauty parlor that I went to said to me, oh, you, you should bleach twice a month, twice a month, right? And it used to stink. It's, it's got this really horrible pungent smell and it obviously like tingles and burns on your skin. And I, I remember just thinking once, like, 
is this good for me? Surely this is like almost burning my skin. So is this good for me? But at that time, I also remember feeling so desperate, wanting to fit in, wanting to belong, because wherever I went, people would question that I actually belonged to my family and, and my parents were my parents. Um, that, you know, especially from the age of six, um, having had that sort of traumatic um, experience, being told that you were left behind because your parents were ashamed of your color, I, I, I just succumbed. I succumbed to that insecurity. And I really, really wish that I could go back in time and I hadn't. But then the other, the other problem that we have with colorism and these products is that they're so, they're widely, uh, widely sold right and you've got the biggest bollywood celebrities endorsing them they are the face of this product we're talking you know from shahrukh khan advertising fair and handsome to uh priyanka chopra advertising fair and lovely we've got you know these people are who you look up to and these people if they're telling you and they're endorsing these products and the narrative from the these creams are the um, fair is beautiful and it's such a strong narrative because what they do is they they had this um, uh, image of a lady on their on their tube in four different shades and going from darker to, to lighter and it's almost like telling you well you are ugly if you are not fair so because these creams and these products were everywhere because they were being advertised by huge, huge celebrities and, and stars that you look up to, because at that time we didn't know what these ingredients are and there was no way of finding out. And of course, because of my own insecurities and you know low self-esteem and um, all these like different reasons, I carried on using them and I used them for decades without even thinking about what it is doing to my skin. Um, it, it only, um, I only stopped using them in 2020 after i started writing my book and after i kind of almost decided that i'm going to become clean it's like a drug you, be, you know literally you become addicted to it because the the narrative is constantly sold in that way that only fair is beautiful so hold on hold on so you mean it when, when did you first start bleaching 1990 what so to be very honest, the first time I actually bought a cream from money that I had been saving was mm -hmm. when I was about 11. 11. So what year is that? Uh, so that would be 88. 88. So, so you've been bleaching for, oh Lord, that's a yeah. long time. Yeah. Over 30 years? Yep. On and off, yeah. Lord Jesus. So, so you finally realize in, in 2020 that, wait a minute, this stuff isn't good for me. Let me ask you a question. Have, have you had any kind of therapy? I think writing my book has been my biggest therapy. It's been the most cathartic thing I've ever done um, because for so many reasons. Firstly, whilst writing the book, I realized what this narrative had done to me as a child because I've written it from that uh, perspective and I've taken the readers on this journey from like the age of a six year old all the way to 45 and how I kind of, you know, just literally was oscillating between wanting to fight colorism and, and succumbing. And I was on the seesaw constantly. Um, also because that desire to fit in and that desire to belong was far stronger than worrying about what the products are doing to me at that time. Mm -hmm. And sadly, I know this sounds really silly, right? But no, it, it doesn't sound silly. It doesn't yeah. sound silly to me because this is the evil of white supremacy and internalized white supremacy mm -hmm. is that there are people who would do horrible things to themselves. And th let's think about this. You have white women literally cooking themselves in tanning beds to get your color. Yeah. Risking their health to get your color. I know. I so, know. So yeah, people that got your color naturally, they don't want it, and white women want it. Like, do you kind of see the connection? The irony is unreal. Yeah, it, it's un it's the biggest irony of my life that I actually was more appreciated for my color, and people were celebrating my color here 
Now, whatever color you are, even that, like, you know, from a white person's perspective, for them to say, oh, your color is beautiful. I wish I could tan as easily as you could. I used and they to mean that. They really mean when they tell you that, that's what they mean. They yeah. mean that. And I used to take that as a compliment. But the point is, they also should be happy with their color. It's not, a, I shouldn't have taken that as a compliment. I should have just been happy with my natural color. So that's also something that I've written about in the book. Like, you know, these are not compliments. These are just them wanting what you have and the grass of course, of course. Being on the other side. They, they, of course, they want melanin. I mean, oh boy, you really want to go deep into that? I mean, they they have ways to even harvest melanin, but that's that's a conversation of a different day. Um, but you know, when they tell you that, it's because your aging process is going to be slow due to the amount of melanin that you have. As long as you're not out there using drugs and eating horribly, you know, not being around stress, negativity, you just like live a peaceful life as much as you can and take care of yourself. You're going to age slowly. When they tell you they really would like to have your color, they mean that because they would love their aging process to slow down and due to right. their genetics. You know, we're talking about the women in particular for sure, or the men too, the aging process is faster. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's why they don't like about women your color. Definitely mm -hmm. they don't like about black women. You know, they hate anybody or even some Hispanic people, some Asian people that's darker, you know, like your darker skin Asians, uh, that, that they age slower. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, they would they would love to have that. So I mean, how I look at it, you know, I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. But mm -hmm. but 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 with that being said, you stopped in 2020. Did it have any effects on your health? Uh thankfully, no. Um, it did take a while, and I kind of cheated a couple of times because the first time that I actually felt it um was in was during a holiday in Thailand in 2016 mm -hmm. when my daughter caught me buying a cream and she asked me very innocently like why are you buying this cream and you know she was nine at the time so she obviously could read and she was a you know very uh switched on child yeah smart young um, child yeah and she um she asked me why are you buying this cream and you know, obviously I was dumbfounded um, that she caught me because I wasn't expecting her to be right behind me. I had asked my uh, daughter to kind of carry on um, with my husband. And I was just kind of, you know, uh, uh, having a little stroll through all the um, stalls in Thailand. And that's also the first time I realized that this is not just an Indian thing. This is actually everywhere. Now, in Japan, the Fair is Beautiful narrative also is rampant. And there are a lot of products in Japan um, in terms of skin whitening products, soaps, you know, you name it, creams. Um, but growing up, I didn't know that. So I only kind of started learning about these things when I started researching for my book. And in Thailand, when my daughter asked me, I was dumbfounded and I didn't know how to respond. So she's she's very, I mean, even, even you know, till date, you, you can't fib and you can't, she, you know, you have to just tell her the truth. <laughs> And so it, I just blurted it out and I said, it, it makes you fairer. And she said, well, why do you want to be fairer? You tell us to be happy with who we are. So, you know, but why are you buying a cream then? Um, and it, it really hit me hard because I realized I was just being such a, such a hypocrite. And that was the first time that I kind of really looked within and I started telling her my whole story. And I said, look, it's not that simple. It's not that easy, you know, we have insecurities and I started actually telling her my entire story about boarding school and the things that were said to me also partly because I didn't want her to um, not appreciate when somebody has insecurities and how they deal with it um, because she let's be very honest goes to um, uh, well at that time she used to go to a school that was predominantly white and she was the minority so she would have had her own insecurities to do with color and so when I started kind of narr narrating the story to her and I told her everything, that's pretty much how I actually took the readers um, through the book as well. That's how I started writing it, that the first time I had this moment of realization and that you know I realized that I was being a hypocrite was 2016. And then after that, I, I, I promised her that I wouldn't use the creams, but I cheated, I, I, I lied to her. Like it was an addiction by that time, you know? So like, I just couldn't shake it off and I, used it but maybe not that frequently but i still continue to use the products um and it's heartbreaking this is after my book is already out there and it's written the most heartbreaking thing that i heard at my book launch 
which was a complete surprise because it was really sweet that my kids wanted to say something at the end and it was unplanned and they came up to the podium and they you know shared how they feel about the journey i've been through and then she confessed and she said i have used my mummy's creams and i went through these insecurities and i am so proud that she's doing this and i don't you know i'm proud of my color now and i don't want to ever think about those creams again I wish if she had told me this years ago, then I would have I would have stopped a couple of years ago. And it's the most heartbreaking thing to to have heard that you know you you think that you think that you you've kind of fought it off, and you know colorism is not going to touch you now. But all it takes is for your child to find the cream, and if your child finds the cream and those products then colorism finds her. And I, I really, really want people to take that away from this interview and understand, please, please, please avoid using these products because the narrative that you are um, essentially selling to your child by using such products is that she or he is not beautiful enough just as they are. Wow. I'm just, you know, I'm listening to that. And, and, you know, I, I know you said your book is therapy and it can be right. It definitely can be, you know, I write books as well, but I, I mean, based off of the time that you've been dealing with this, you know, and now you say your, your daughter, or, or I think it's your daughter, correct? The one that found the cream and, and you say she ended up using it. Yeah. Okay. With, you know, I really believe that, you know, just I say consider it. I think therapy is really in order because for, for how long it was and, mm -hmm. and you don't want your daughter to go down that, that road. Right. Like, mm -hmm. like for me, it's like, it baffles me to, to even hear that. Cause like I said, listen, I was called names too growing up. I was called dark as night. I was called blackie. I was called tar. I was called kind of names with, with people within my own community. Right. But that's still kind of like what they would do. They kind of roast you a little bit, but mm -hmm. uh, uh, cause I grew up in a time period where, uh, people laugh about this where well, you had your, your, the time of the light skinned brothers, like, like you had your, your Prince and your elder boys and all these people, you know, these, these people. <laughs> and, yeah. and then later the dark skinned brothers came back in around the nineties or so, you know, and the dark skinned brothers kind of been okay, but where they at? Cause you know, back in the, the that part of the eighties, the light skinned brothers. Yes. Um, but you know, for me, you know, I had issues with my color at one point in time. Right. But mm -hmm. then I realized, wait a minute, I, I got this way. God made me. You know, mm -hmm. I'm happy with it. Uh, I love my skin color. I, I love it. it and, and that's it. But I've never in my mind thought that, okay, well, let me see if I could be, you know, lighter. My, my In my mind, what I've had, you know, in this country, at least, is not even being lighter, but like, how would it feel to be white so I can get all these privileges so I can mm -hmm. do whatever the hell I want and everybody give an excuse for it. Um, mm -hmm. I can be mediocre and still get uh, a big loan at the bank, or, you know, I can get a job, don't need education, just show up because I'm white. You know, that's more sort of thoughts that I've had, right? Mm -hmm. But I never said, oh, I want to try to look white. It's just not going to happen because in this country, it don't matter if you got a white parent, if you got one drop of black blood, you are still considered a Negro in this country. That's just bottom line. Um, yeah. But yeah, from what you're saying, um, it, for me, just hearing it's quite, it's quite sad. You know, I'm just saying this, just being realistically. Um, mm. and yeah, I, I really hope you, you know, can get, you know, more healing from that. Cause it's been so long. It's, it, it became literally a lifestyle, you know? Yeah, right? it did. absolutely. It yeah. did. It became um, a standard product in my basket. Yeah. Uh, so, basket. yeah. But, the, but, but even though after dealing with all of that, right mm -hmm. now, let, let's go, let's go back to what we said in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Why are black people the problem? That's my thing because recently, and you, maybe, you know, the reason why, um, the Indian government was, you know, deporting mass deporting Nigerians, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard some stories, not all Indian people, because I want to make sure I don't say all because it's not all, mm -hmm. but there are some that do have anti black racism. So, out of all that you told me about colonization, skin mm -hmm. bleaching, internalized white supremacy, you know, all different things that's been done by, by the you know, Indians being taken into the African continent to be indentured servants in these colonies even in africa right and they're still there to this day some of them and i've heard stories you know out of south africa you know that they had became racist even Idi Amin at one point in time uganda had kicked out indians because they all the racism they was doing 
over right. there and even the certain business practices in Uganda, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but but the question is, why is there an issue with us if some people within your community don't even like themselves? We didn't colonize you. We didn't steal your resources. We didn't, you know, violate, no word I'm trying not, not to say, the women, right? So why love the white supremacists and hate the black man and black woman? Why? So I, this is my personal opinion. Um, sure. It, it really is so unfortunate, but I think it does boil down to color and it boils down to Indians having this mindset that black people are, are not um, uh, successful and they're darker, so they're not as beautiful. Um, and they're just not that, um, uh, you know, kind of worthy almost. I mean, I, I hate to say this, but that's the mindset that I have seen in people. And also because we were talking about casteism and um, classism in India, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, casteism, the word for casteism in India is called Varna, V-A-R-N-A. Varna literally means color. So now correct me if I'm wrong, you know, we're talking thousands and thousands of years ago. I don't think they meant color as in red, green, yellow, and blue <laughs> back then, right? They, they probably had this whole caste system based on people's skin tone. And if that's the case, then that is a very, very, very shameful system to begin with anyway. And casteism, of course, there's, you know, there's Brahmins and then there's the Kshatriyas. And the, um, so the Brahmins are like the priests and the people that uh, you look up to in terms of giving you uh, religious knowledge um, and, and helping you with salvation, etc. Kshatriyas are like the warriors and kings and queens, etc. Um, and then are the Vaishnas, uh, which is um, the business class, um, and then the Shudras, which is the labor class. And then another class was added, which is called the Dalits, which is the untouchables. Can you imagine? Um, and generally speaking, people in India, they still follow the caste system um, very, very passionately. Um, I was shocked, for example, to be going out for dinner with a, you know, a reasonably close friend here in the UK um, who I've known for the last two decades since I moved to the country, didn't realize that he's actually into casteism himself. Um, and over dinner, we were talking about some issue and he, and he said, oh, it all boils down to the caste that you belong for, you know, belong to and your education. Very casually mentioned casteism. Now I know that there's no, you know, black people in terms of like the caste, where, where do they fit, right? But it boils down to them looking down upon black people for their color and the, the, the poverty that they think, you know, is there in Africa and so therefore classism and the fact that Africans were slaves for a long long time so and they... Indians were slaves too exactly yeah exactly that, that's, that's what I'm trying to get like when people look <laughs> when people who were literally colonized or you say for 200 years who do you think was building up the place for the white people in in India it was it was not the white people the white people was crossing their legs drinking tea and and telling you do this do this carry that dude like i don't i don't understand that but but there is but what i'm saying is just even looking at you 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 and my mother is the same color mm -hmm. same skin tone literally so how how was someone even your same skin tone just my mom is just black you know black american of course mm -hmm. and, and you're indian how would my mom be less than than the, than an indian person that has the mm -hmm. same skin tone that that doesn't even make sense yeah. Just even listening to what you're saying, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't sense. make sense. You're but, absolutely right. But let me ask you a question oh, about this, though, in it. India, because I've heard the caste system is real. Oh, I heard they, mm -hmm. they have what they call that honor killings, too, behind that stuff? Yes. With the women? Yes. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I also heard that men can violate women and get away with it behind honor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is that acceptable? It's it's really really shameful. It's disgusting. It's I yeah. just don't understand why, but yeah, it, it happens. And unfortunately, these men get away with it. And politicians are perpetuating this sort of behavior when 
women are violated and politicians, you know, on a huge, huge social platform are saying things like, well, of course it had to happen because, you know, she, why, why was she dressed that way? Or, you know, why, why was she trying to get married into this caste when she knows that she comes from a lower caste? Like, just... Well, well, a story popped in my head about this girl. I saw, I saw it was on uh, the Daily Mail out of India, hmm. and she was gang violated. This was a a, a teenage girl. Mm -hmm. She went to the police, and the police violated her. Oh, that is just. How the hell you have a society where that go on? Because how I feel about any man that do that to a girl, woman, child, etc. Mm. Let me see if I can say this in a very. I, I I think you just need to go meet you know uh, uh, the mm. devil. I point. think I mean I think you uh, need to go meet him personally. Yeah. Um, you should not be walking around here in in civilized society. No, I absolutely agree. Um, I mean, if if I had it my way, these people would be punished extremely severely. Um, but. You know, it's it they is the old testament. That's what they need. You know, you remember the old testament with the Lord say to happen to people that commit sin? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get yeah. them stones. That's what they need. <laughs> that's sick. that's sure sick to me. Oh, that's sick. How could you do something like that? And then you get away. See, it couldn't be me, it couldn't be my kid. Because okay, the law ain't gotta do nothing. I want to find out every last one of y'all who it is, and I'll deal with you. Mm. Mm, that's no, and I'm pretty I'm sure, sure that has happened. These things happen and i'm not proud of them um you know india it's a very large country well in mm -hmm. terms of population we're talking 1.4 billion people now right correct there's a lot of uh desperateness there's a lot of um chaos there's a lot of um political unrest there's a lot going on i mean generally speaking the country is running really well like i'm actually quite surprised like you enter a country with 1.4 billion people and you're like, oh, okay, this, everything seems to be, you know, working, everything's fine. But, you know, you hear of these story, stories and behind the scene what's going on. And, you know, it's, it, it's heart wrenching and heartbreaking and it disgusts you. Yeah. So, but, so to me, it sounds like black people shouldn't be the problem of nobody. They got a whole lot to fix on their own yeah. over there. Right. There is. There is. Yeah. There's a lot yeah. of work to be done. A lot of work to be done. With their, yeah. And I've been talking about internalized racism among South Asians a lot, actually, on my TikTok page and, you should. You know, and Instagram as well. And I'm like, I'm sorry, but you can't you can't point fingers at others. You can't call out systemic racism when you are actually not kind to your own kind. It's it's like a woman uh, joining a feminism you know, protest and putting her husband and son on a pedestal at home. Like, play, actually, plenty of them do that, believe it or not, especially in the, in the white community. They'll be the biggest feminists and go home and got a husband. But yeah, yeah. They'll, tell, but they'll tell black women and, and other groups of women outside of white, yeah, you need to be a feminist, and da, 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 you know, that sort of thing. And unfortunately, unfortunately, that has taken root in my community, unfortunately, and that's caused a lot of problems. But, mm -hmm. you know, you know, with, 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 that, with that being said in itself, I just like, you know, I'm just shaking my head at some of this, you know, stuff that's going on here and what you're talking about. Just my opinion, I think due to your your history, you should be a big advocate speaking against um, skin lightening creams, Absolutely. Uh, highlighting. I'm not saying I'm just just talking in general, highlighting it, going to war against the companies, exposing the ingredients like I think you should because who else going to talk about it? If you got a 30 year history with it. Who else? 100 percent. Yeah. And I have been doing that. And. What I'm also trying to do at the same time, though, is change mindsets, because I think if you if we go after the companies and the companies, you know, say we were to achieve like banning a certain product, right? If it's still here and you're still obsessed by that narrative that fair is beautiful, you're going to find other ways. You, you're going to find homemade remedies, you know, which, again, I've seen my aunts do over time. That's you're true. Find, you, you're going to put a hat that's on That's true. But this, but this is where you go with that. It's not about the people that's not going to change. It's about the people that may hear the message and yeah. say, you know what, man, I didn't think about it like that. Oh, yeah. wow. She's she dealing with this because not only it can help people in India, but it also can help people in the Caribbean because there's some there's some black women in the Caribbean that bleach. There's some mm -hmm. black women in the African continent that bleach. Right. That I mm -hmm. do know of.
You know, mm -hmm. they talk about cake soap in the Caribbean and all that sort of thing, right? So I think that it's not about worrying about people who's not going to change. It's it's worried about could you save at least one? Could you save ten? Could you yeah. save a hundred? You can't save everybody. Not yeah. all going to be saved. Even the scriptures teach that. But that's what my focus at. Even in what I do, it's not yeah. about everybody. It's about the people that you can reach. Hundred percent, and that's the that's exactly my objective behind this book. Uh, in terms of spreading my message. I've had people review the book saying, you know, brutally honest, um, holding a mirror up to my own unconscious biases. Um, you know, I'm a changed person after reading this book. I've got uh, white people who actually didn't have any idea about colorism and, you know, people who actually genuinely care about colorism and, and what uh, colonization has done to the South Asian mindset. And not even South Asian, let's be honest, right? We're talking about there's white supremacy and then there's the rest of the world. So basically, if you're not white, you're a person of color. If you're a person of color, then you're constantly, um, uh, you, you're constantly Shaweta, told. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but that's one term I don't like is per person of color. Um, we all are individual groups of people. Mm. We in all our, our communities should be respected. I think it's so disrespectful to say we're white and the rest of you are just people of color. Like, really? That's white. To me, that's white supremacy because they came oh, up with it, not you. Yes. Th yeah. That's white supremacy to me to say Indian people don't shouldn't be reckoned, you know, called out black people, African people, different mm -hmm. Asian groups, different Arab groups. These are individual groups of people with history, lineage, uh, got families, etc. cetera. And you're going to just throw them in a box. Oh, yeah, you people of color, but we white. That's why I don't like that term. No, 100 percent agree. Yeah. And that's how white people look at other people. Right. Um, they see everybody else that is not white as in, they put everybody in this one box, you know, person of color. Unfortunately, people have started believing that. And literally we're talking from once, you know, you end from like, you know, the United States to, to Europe. After that, you get into the Middle East. Even the Middle Eastern countries are obsessed with skin whitening. Even. Yeah. Well, uh, because white supremacy Unfortunately, the doctrine of white supremacy is global. It is a global doctrine, unfortunately, because yeah. white supremacy has control of the world at this moment, even because it's a it's indirect white supremacy and it's different. It's direct white supremacy, which I live in, right? In America, yeah. I live in direct white supremacy. Indians deal with indirect white supremacy and internalized white supremacy. Mm -hmm. But I think internalized white supremacy it's worse. Now, what I mean by indirect white supremacy, sure, all you leave is an Indian, etc. But how far are they going to really go sometime in the in the Western world is really mm -hmm. having their hands in your country still, even though they got Indian leaders. You know what I'm saying? That's, I mean, that's what I mean, like an indirect uh, yeah, white yeah, supremacy. Yeah. Uh, even if a white person go to your country and commit a crime, they, a lot of times they'll just get a slap on the wrist uh, and, and, and let and, and just deport it versus let's say if an African person went to your country it, it'll be held to pay. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, 100%. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I have no qualms in talking about that. I see a few people on Instagram who are like, you know, white people, either they're Americans or Russians or whatever, white women who have found themselves in India and they're, they've totally, you know, kind of like embraced the culture and the language and everything. Fluent Hindi speakers, they wear Indian clothes, they're married to an, you know, to an Indian man, live in India, Indian family, et cetera, et cetera. Oh my God, they're put on a pedestal. Honestly, they're put on a pedestal. But if a black person was to do the same thing, would the black person be put on a pedestal? Well, let me ask you a question. I'm curious to know this because this is kind of what I've experienced and heard throughout the world. Africans, are they treated one way in India and black Americans treated another? Um, that I have to say, I don't know. No, no, because from, from what I have seen personally and any, what I've heard from many travelers mm -hmm. is that if a person's African and, and, and I don't know why, because we, you know, like I said, I'm African descent. I may live in America, but it seems like when black Americans travel, we get a different reaction, I guess, coming from America versus okay. or even if they come from the UK. Right. A black person yeah. from the UK right. um, go to a, a different country versus one of my you know African brothers and sisters that go. They get a different reaction. Mm -hmm. That's what the only reason I had asked that it's question. Probably got to do with the language, and again, that's also the same. You know, we have the same issue in terms of like white supremacy and internalized racism, right? Mm, okay. You speak English, you're educated. Mm, yeah. Okay. Um. So yeah, so they treat you differently. Um. Okay. 
I mean, Hindi is such a beautiful language. It's the most, you know, one of the oldest languages in the world, you know, developed from Sanskrit. Sanskrit has been taught all over the world in, you know, the top universities in the world. And yet, when you land in India, I speak fluent Hindi and I'm trying to speak to somebody in Hindi and they'll respond in English. <laughs> wow. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, that this is, happened, that is, I remember that is this so thing. interesting. This well, well, when I was 13 years old and I went to somebody's house for dinner and I was trying and trying and trying just to be speaking in Hindi and, you know, normally. And this kid did not respond back with one word of Hindi. He just spoke only in English. Like yeah, you know, I've heard of, yeah. I've actually heard of that on the African continent too. Like when, you, when they go to school, like a lot of times they have their own local languages, but yeah. in school they won't, a lot of times want them to speak English. And just yeah. recently, you know, I remember uh, Julius Malema, shout out to our brother Julius Malema. He was pushing, you say, hey, we need to be learning, you know, Swahili should be the nat, should be the uh, the language for the continent because that is an African language, Swahili, you know? And he yeah. even has some pushback of people saying that, you know, believe it or not. Um, but, you know, so I get exactly what you're saying. You know, white supremacy has definitely had its evil influence um, mm -hmm. all over the world. Like I say, white supremacy is a doctrine of demons. And I've always said publicly, it is hell spawn. Basically, just everything you said, you know, and how it's affect people worldwide. But you know, tell people, show people about your book. Tell people how can they get your book. They probably say, okay, I want to check this book out. You know, let people know. Thank you. Um, can I just add one more thing about white supremacy around the world? So I grew up in Japan, right? Um, it's never been colonized, right? Never. Um, but they're so obsessed with whiteness over there that I remember vividly when I was growing up in my teenage years, kids were dyeing their hair blonde. They were wearing blue contact lenses and white people, if they stepped, you know, into the country, oh my God, they were treated like God. So whereas, you know, Indians sometimes like I remember being stared at because I was so different, darker skin tone, curlier hair. Um, I, I found it very unsettling. Um, Fair enough, at that time, back in the 1980s, they didn't actually maybe see a foreigner ever in their lives. So, you know, I guess you look, um, but it's about how you look, right? And when you look at a white person, i.e. American, that look is completely different. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Like, it's everywhere. It's not just countries that have been colonized, which is so, so sad because it's kind of just spread. Um, even without any reason. Um, but yeah, anyway, I just want to Yeah, I, I understand it because that's that's more so the, the wider skin Asians in, in Japan. Because mm -hmm. if you look at a person like from Thailand, the Philippines, Cambodia, those Asians, they are treated horribly because mm -hmm. of their darker skin Asians that's versus right. the white skin Asians like your South Koreans, your, um, like you say, your Japanese, some of your Chinese as, as, as whiter skin. I mean, they want to get rid of some of them do eyelid surgery to get rid of their eyes. And it's all kind of things. Yeah. So it's just not Indians. There's a whole lot of people have been affected. Absolutely. But, you know, let show people your book. Tell people how they can get to it. So this is the book that I have written. It's called The Black Rose. Um, it took me about two years to write because I've never written before. Um, but it's literally me pouring my heart out, sharing a message about colorism and what it does to you. Um, as a very young child and how it brainwashes you into believing that only fair is beautiful. And I've taken the readers through a journey um, from the age of six all the way to 45, and which also includes uh, me kind of uh, getting rid of my addiction and, and getting clean, as I say. Um, and, and, and the fact that I am proud to be the Black Rose uh you know 45 but i love my color now i enjoy beach holidays i don't wear any caps unless of course i want to protect my skin in terms of um harmful rays but the reason earlier used to be protecting myself from getting a tan now it's got nothing to do with that i've stopped using the creams it's been two years now and i'm so proud of myself and i really 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 hope that if you do get your hands on this book that it helps you with your healing journey too. It might be painful to begin with because it will trigger certain experiences that you might have been through. But I think that we need to walk through that pain in order to heal. Um, and that's what I've done with this book. So please help me fight colorism. Um, 
please stop using the products. Never mind this book, but just stop using the products, please, and um, embrace your melanin and wear it with pride. All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll make sure to, you know, we'll get a link from Shweta here and we'll make sure to put that where Pete, you can click it and go buy the book. I think you should buy it and, and here, you know, white supremacy has affected not just black folk, but it's affected uh, everyone outside of white, whether they admit it or not. Either they're going to fight against it or they're going to succumb to it. So Shweta, you know, thank you for joining us on the show today. We greatly appreciate it. And uh, it, it was great to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you um, giving me your time and um, helping me spread my message, uh, fighting colorism. And um, yeah, I, I really hope that our two communities can come together and fight this together because, you know, as I say, we're stronger together.